Okay, so let's talk about the difficult airway. Important, 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 right? And everyone take a deep breath. It's gonna be okay. We're gonna visualize and get through this together. Which is what you should do on a regular basis. Yes. So we're gonna kind of talk about all the steps in this, but this is really worth mental gymnastics. Yes. Like on purpose, like what if this, what if this, what if this? Cause yes. when it happens, now you're mentally prepared yeah. and you just have to do the physical skill. Exactly. So risk factors for the difficult airway. We all live and breathe this, but it's, you know, stuff that is fairly obvious. Anything that distorts the anatomy, is going to be a problem, right? So obesity, facial hair, being edentulous, having a short neck, having a limited neck mobility is really scary, right? If you have a small chin, if you have teeth that are kind of abnormal, <laughs> it's just any sort of trauma, right? Like if, if you have blunt trauma, penetrating trauma that distorts the airway, that's concerning. Same thing with tumors, angioedema always gives me palpitations. It does. Right, and then sort of the inflammatory angriness that can happen with Ludwig's or any sort of Burns. other inflammatory mm -hmm. issue like burn and infections, yeah. So and the key now though is like, okay, I know all of these things, but when would each of these bits affect the kinds of things I might do to somebody's airway? Because some right. of them may affect bagging right. only. Some of them right. may affect an extraglottic airway only. Right. Some may affect all of it. It might help you think about what adjuncts to bring to the bedside exactly. too, to figure out what you need. So grouping these now would be useful to find yeah. a way. It's like, what's gonna affect my laryngoscopy? What's gonna affect my bagging? What's gonna right. affect my, my ability to cut someone's neck? So right. regrouping these into categories would be useful. So right. how do we do that? Yeah, so let's talk about lemon. Right. So L is for looking externally, which we do every day. Yeah, and right. this is the, this will tell you whether you're going to be able to see down there. Exactly. So when something gets down there, with I'm looking or right. I'm looking through with my video scope, can I see? Right. Right. So can I visualize what I need to see to be able to do this procedure? Right. And then E is for evaluate. So this is a three three two rule. So it's the incisor distance. So have them open their mouth and see how many fingers you okay, can. I'll hold. be Vanna. Ready? Yeah, Here we go. go. Okay. Uh, there you go. Three fingers. That's good. That's good. I can open the mouth and I can look inside, right? Then it's sort of the high mental distance. So demonstrate for us. There you go. Three fingers right there. That's great. And then two, thyroid to mouth. It's really the floor of the mouth. It's a little counterintuitive, but floor of the mouth down to your thyroid. So you can take two. it from the high down because my fingers are ready. And exactly. Then see see where yeah. that goes. And that so three, proportion three, is important. Yeah, very important. And, and then it's it, a person's fingers, not yours, not somebody <laughs> good else's. Good point, actually, because I have some fingers. small fingers. You have yeah. small fingers, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good point. And so then you want to think melon potty, which I'll show you a picture of before, but three or greater, you know, I'm going to mm -hmm. worry a little bit. And then if there's an obstruction, right? So any condi condition that was going to help um, obstruct the airway and kind of block your views. And we can all really come key. up with a long list of That's those that scare the you know what's out of us all. Right, mm -hmm. right. And then neck mobility, right? Is that person going to be in a C collar? Is that person in a halo? Is that person just got a stiff neck in or general Or is that from person like else? from a nursing home who's been kind of curled up for a long time exactly. where they They're cannot physically and, move their uh, neck back? Yeah. That's scary stuff too. Exactly. Right? And the reason the three three two rules, three three two rule is important is that just the, the um, engineering of most of our airway products are meant to have a normal relationship for the curves yes. to all work right. If somebody's somebody doesn't have the right anatomy there, it'll be too long. It'll push the airway out of the way. Right. So it's meant that a lot of these things have been engineered for those normal proportions. Right. And when you don't have that, you, things get kind of tricky. Even if you're using the right equipment. Yeah. And so the melon potty is helpful. And this is all, all about sort of what you can visualize when the patient opens their mouth, right? So class one, beautiful, love it, great. Complete visualization of the entire soft palate. Everything. Everything, and in, the and uvula, children, love sometimes it. the epiglottis is hanging out in the back. Yeah, it's true. You're like, oh, hi, epiglottis, mm -hmm. how's yeah. it going? All right, and then class two is complete visualization of the uvula, but you can see how like the airway is getting a little smaller. And then class three is like, you can really only see like a tiny bit of the uvula. And mm -hmm. class four is just Nothing. pink. You're like, yeah. what? And this is loosely core. This gets criticized a lot, the melon potty, except we do it all the time. We're comfortable with yeah. it. And it correlates loosely with what you're going to see when you put a blade down. Right. Right. It doesn't mean, if you see a class four, it doesn't mean you're not going to be able to right. intubate them. Right. But it does mean the odds are your visualization isn't going to be beautiful. Exactly. You may still see a retinoids. You may get a good view of everything if you're lucky. Um, but it just means that you need to prepare, It's going to be, be a prepared. little trickier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so this approach to the difficult airway, I think having a systematic approach to like what you do so when important. things are not going well is really important. And I think the key here is whether you start with direct or you start with video is to have the backup ready. Always. Right? I put the bougie to next to me 
for every patient because you, you just never know. Mm -hmm. Things might be in and the airway. You can use a bougie lots of different ways. Exactly. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll get to that later. And then, you know, if you start out with direct and you can't get it, like maybe after a couple tries, you got to do something different. So maybe do video and then vice versa. I mean, nowadays with COVID, everyone loves video laryngoscopy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not the right thing. Right. And sometimes it's not the right thing. So mm -hmm. if you're not getting anywhere with it, if there's too much stuff like secretions that are blocking your view, switch it up and do direct. Right. And I think right. the key also is all about preparation. Mm -hmm. Like procedures for us are all about the prep and if you don't think about it and you're not ready right. and when things come time and you're stressed out and things are that's really why your hectic, bougie is there yeah right so your extra glottic airway is right, there you right. know where your crike kit is right, sometimes so if you it's have even time pre-oxygenate you know resuscitate that person do apneic oxygenation take the time if you take can. the time like, like, if you have it if right. you can keep them stable enough take right. the time absolutely right. and never do the same thing twice exactly so you sometimes you only Try have one different. or two or three shots at right. something don't ever do it again that's right. like that's the, what the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again mm -hmm. expecting a different outcome yeah so do something do different. something think different. about what was it that didn't work right that's what i need to address right and mm -hmm. really it's sort of the practice and the mechanics of it so the more you do it the better you get and the mental try exercise something different. like what if i looked down there and there was right. broccoli what if i looked down right. there and there was a dental pl plate right. you know I, yeah. and don't forget about the lma right like i think people always kind of throw it aside but like lma can save you oh completely right oxygenate, if you ventilate. actually ventilate buy you time to figure out what you're going to do next or to get the anesthesiologist down right. here and sometimes you, some you have the kind you can intubate through exactly. and then you got that taken care of right. so exactly. there's, we're really smart at this I, i'm amazed from i've been practicing long enough that we didn't even have paralytics when i started mm -hmm. um it was just crazy and it's, we have game. gotten so good at this yeah. and you all are really good at this the key yeah. is just to have a systematic approach on exactly. how you're going to do this exactly right and then you know if you got to the surgical airway, you got to do that crack, do the crack. And I think the hardest thing about doing the crack is deciding to do yeah. the crack, right? Pulling the trigger to be like, no, I got to take care of this, right? Mm -hmm. So if you really can't intubate, you can't ventilate, you can't, you can't buy time with the LMA because something anatomically is an issue, you got to get in there. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's an airway in there somewhere. Oh, there is. Everyone. You just got to go <laughs> fetch it. You got to go find it, <laughs> dissect around and go get it. And the scalpel finger tube technique is great. The bougie can also help bougie. you as well. The bougie trick is great. And then putting in the smaller 6-0 tube in and securing yeah. it that way. The bougie is nice. So that one of the things to have that bougie at the bedside is sometimes when, if you're doing a, a crack in somebody who's alive, it's going to bleed. Yes. Um, it's just going to bleed and yes. you just have to be prepared for that. Yes. And that's where feeling is important. You'll feel the trachea and you'll feel if there's stuff yeah. in the front of it, you kind of just can dissect it away. Yeah. And if you cut, make your cut in the cracothyroid membrane, you can take the bougie and just feed it through right then and there. Exactly. This idea of the trach hook and turning it and lifting oh, yeah. it. And, I, mean, and, I mean, it works. It's great. And once you have a trach hook in there, that airway is going nowhere. Right. But the bougie is just as good. Bougie is nice. Yeah, exactly. And I think the other thing too is like if you're already worried that this is going to be a difficult airway is to, in your head, look and figure out the anatomy beforehand and mm -hmm. then like if you have a sharpie on you just mark it real quick Absolutely. because you might and get prep the neck prep the neck exactly mm -hmm. you might get to that point and you've already thought about it and it's one less barrier for you to get to that point and be ready to take care of things. exactly I mean, in, in a moonlighting situation one of my actual classmates and i were on together when a guy came in with the most amazing angioedema i have oh. ever seen and it was we both were like oh and he said this one's yours it's like oh, no 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 <laughs> we're doing this together so you go get the surgical airway i'll take care of the right. up above stuff and right. we're gonna do this together i'll be done we did great I mean, yeah. it turned out great we and the key cut, is this is a tactile procedure too. Like uh, although you're looking for the anatomy when you're dissecting, you're really this is all tactile. You're trying to feel for that membrane. So yep. especially when things are bleeding, it's it's gonna be yep. tough to see. And it's fine. You know what it feels like. So you just it's fine. It's yeah. fine. It's all fine. <laughs> So awake intubation is actually a really good trick to have up our Super sleeves too, right? Important. So if you can think about it, I mean, there's a long list here, but you can sort of think about it in somebody who's going to be a difficult intubation, has a history of difficult intubation before, has something that might get in the way if you paralyze them, mm -hmm. right? So something that's going to drop down and obstruct your view. And then, you know, if somebody is, um, you know, difficult to, to mask and, and sort of has a risk of aspiration from laying down. And so those types of things, want them you, upright. you want them upright. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you want to be able to do it in a way where you can kind of have them awake. So you, you don't paralyze them or run into trouble. Yeah, this is funny because this is something that's relatively new into emergency it medicine is. practice. Yes. It's been probably 15 years. It's really been on everybody's radar. And it's actually more and more common mm -hmm. um, because we're getting better at how to prep Yes. how to actually physically do it. Yeah. I think things like our videoscopes have made this easier. Mm -hmm. um, so it is something to, because there are times where you don't want to stop somebody breathing. You yeah. want them to stay breathing yeah. and stay awake. Yeah, so you don't run into trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our anesthesia colleagues do it all the time. Yeah, for sure. So 
this is sort of a good way to sort of think about the things that you need to do to prepare for an awake intubation, right? So obviously pre-oxygenate, get that oxygen on, leave it on throughout the procedure, and then you want to numb, 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 numb everything, right? So topical lidocaine, you can spray it, you can nebulize it. I think there's sort of different routes of doing this, but you want to numb all the things. Mm -hmm. You can use lidocaine gel, you can do the sort of highly lidocaine recommend lollipop thing. Smear it. Right, smear it on top of like a tongue depressor and get it way back in there and mm -hmm. have the patient just like sit it as far back as they can tolerate it, mm -hmm. numb all the things up. And the number they get, the more they can tolerate it this. Exactly. So they can actually, and you're gonna have them upright, you have your S section, you're okay, keeping track right. of everything, but right. this is really key. Right, you can also get something like glycopyrrolate and like dry things up back there too, so you can have less secretions, yep. right. And then ultimately you wanna sedate them, right? And then you wanna do the actual intubation. Right. And the sedation, so th there's some debate on which sedation to use, yeah, but ketamine point. is really awesome in yeah, this. Yeah, ketamine is great. They're breathing, they stay breathing with sedation. You don't suppress their respiratory effort on this. They're right. amnestic. Their reflexes are all there. Right. Mm -hmm. So that one's actually kind of a nice one. Yes. Um, it, you got to be a little bit careful because laryngospasm can happen and you've already put a bunch of junk back <laughs> in there. But honestly, this that is probably the best drug for yeah, this. Yes, I agree. I think ketamine is a great drug.